Good morning. Um, as it says, I'm Chris Lewis. I'm the company fuel specialist for Rolls-Royce and I'm here today to talk to you primarily uh, about the fuel in terms of its uh, use today. Um, Rolls-Royce is part of this process that I want to talk about is how we got to the point where we uh, proved the fuel for today's flight. But before I do that, I'd like to give you a bit of background about fuel specifications uh, and the properties that we require. And it builds on what uh, Jennifer said about the need for a drop in fuel that meets today's fuel performance requirements. Uh, energy storage in the aircraft, this is the first one, and it seems pretty obvious that the fuel's the energy storage medium. What isn't perhaps so obvious is that kerosene is an excellent uh, energy storage uh, from a density, from both a density per unit mass and a density per unit volume. And it's very difficult for other fuels to compete with that. Um, not only does it affect uh, range and payload, but of course if you've got sort of some of the first generation biofuels that have got oxygen in there, that is in effect dead weight. So you're carrying that weight round uh, and you would increase your carbon dioxide um, emissions because of that, uh, you know, carrying the weight and not getting any benefit from it. Um, the second point is, is the fuel has to operate over a very wide temperature range. Um, as I already said, the freeze point of minus 47 is required because the, air, the uh, fuel sits in the wing tanks at high altitude, long flights, gets down to very cold temperatures. But from a safety point of view of handling in the aircraft and on the ground, it needs a flash point of at least 38 degrees centigrade. So they're two quite conflicting requirements. And again, it's very difficult to get those two uh, properties from, from any other sort of uh, medium. The, the third is the thermal stability which has already been mentioned. Uh, this is because the fuel is used as a coolant for both the aircraft systems and particularly on the engine. The engine runs at very high temperatures in the core of the engine and a lot of heat is rejected from the engine into the transmission and bearing systems. Uh, the oil is recirculated around there to keep those cool to allow them to operate within reasonable temperature range. So there's a lot of heat comes out of the oil system and what we do is we put that back into the fuel and then put that back into the engine so we're recycling a lot of heat. That means that the fuel gets very hot and needs to withstand that. Uh, also the injectors sit in a combustor that's at very high temperature and again that means that the fuel going through the injectors is at high temperature. Basically, if the fuel was not able to withstand those temperatures, you would increase fouling rates and, and probably cause problems with reliability. So how do we make sure that the fuel that you use every day meets these stringent and demanding requirements? Um, jet fuels around the world are actually supplied to two specifications, the Jet A and the Jet A1, and the only difference really between those is the freeze point. Jet A has a freeze point of minus 40, used in the States a lot, and Jet A rest of the world minus 47 for lower operating temperatures. But it's a worldwide standard that everybody has to work to and the whole industry has to supply and use this standard. Uh, and the analogy I often use for people to understand this is it's, it's like drinking water. If you go to uh, most countries and you drink water out of the tap or out of bottled water, it may be to different specifications, it may taste slightly differently, uh, but nonetheless it will make you healthy, it won't make you ill and that's the way jet fuel is today. So it ensures safety, ensures the engine meets its emissions requirements, it has the right performance uh, and, and the engine maintains its durability. Um, so what does a specification look like? I'm not going to go through that today because it's fairly detailed but basically it has two key parts. The first is it looks at the composition and, and, and some performance properties so it makes some controls on what can be in there and it also makes some controls on minimum performance requirements. The Jeff Top test, test is one example of that. Um, but it also has allowable source materials and processes. This is because uh, we have to control where the fuel comes from and ensure that it is always fit for purpose. And at the current time, the Jatropha material that we're using today actually doesn't meet that second part. It meets the first part, as I'll talk about in a moment, but it's not an allowable source. So, to, do, to allow the flight to go ahead today, Rolls-Royce had to do some extra testing to make sure that this fuel was, was fit for the purpose of today's test. So the fuel was ben blended over in New Zealand and um, a sample sent across to the UK. And the blend is a 50-50 blend, so it's 50% of the Jatropha material and the other 50% was, was Jet A1. Uh, so the first thing is we did the standard specification test requirements. 
and the fuel met or exceeded most of those requirements. So that, that was good, that was the first sort of hurdle. The second was, we looked at the purity, so we did some very uh, forensic analytical work on it, uh, and again the fuel is probably purer than a normal Jet A1 actually, um, very low sulphur, very low trace metals and so on, so excellent from that point of view. So in summary, the, I'm now going to talk in how this all fits in with both Rolls-Royce's strategy and the industry, and we see the introduction of biofuels as both for uh, a challenge because we're dealing with new materials but we have to preserve performance and safety but there are opportunities and the challenge is supporting the industry from a Rolls-Royce point of view we don't make fuel we don't do the processing but we have to be supportive um, and provide the opportunities for people to uh, come along and use our equipment uh, like today is a classic case where we sort of allow somebody to come along and use their fuel in our engine and see how it goes it's a, a scientific experiment uh, we've looked at the fuel in detail. We will be examining the engine afterwards uh, to look at how the, the fuel performed. Uh, and that's the key point. All our strategies at Rolls-Royce, and this one's just the same, it has to be under, underpinned by science and technology, and we're gathering that today. I'll just finish off very briefly. Um, I've talked about the suitability, but Rolls-Royce, the same as the other partners, have these key uh, criteria for any fuel that we'd look at either now or in the future it has to be suitable for aviation uh, it has to be sustainable um, and it has to be able to be produced in significant quantities uh, again a, a very brief comment about where we go from here um, Rolls-Royce is active as uh, the other partners are on, on specification committees we're already we're at ASTM in December which is the main US specification committee and um, we're already engaged with the UK DEF stand committee who's the leading European specification and we're already setting the ground to ensure that f the within the timescales Air New Zealand's aspirations will be met that the fuel will be approved in the timescales that they require. Rolls-Royce has a vision technology strategy which is a program that looks at at creating world-class gas turbines that are cleaner, quieter and more efficient. And as far as we, we see, this, sort of, this strategy is complementary to that in that they both are looking at reducing the environmental impact of aviation, but by two quite different means. Thank you.